as a fellow uh, New Yorker and a New York City architect, I'm excited that our first and next speaker is Lewis Cole from Handel Architects. If you don't know Handel, they've done a lot of really incredible projects. I feel like um, Handel is a, is a great example of a company that was already doing really good architecture. They were already doing great buildings. And then they came in and they started doing high performance building, now they're doing passive house buildings. Um, it's a great example of, of how to get it right in both places. Lewis is the director of sustainable design at Handel, where he leads the firm's mission to drive industry leaders in a sustainable practice. And today he's going to take us inside New York City's policy driven approach, which is shaping the adoption of passive house at scale how practitioners can advocate for a broader adoption. He's also going to share some of the valuable resources and strategies that you can use to support those efforts on your own. With that, I'll hand it over to Lewis. Great. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, and you know, thank you to Passive House Accelerator, Reimagined Buildings Collective, uh, for, for uh, having me here. I'm very excited to be here and share this with you all today. Uh, as, you, as Michael said, I'm the director of sustainable design handle architects. I'm also the co-chair of the uh, policy committee at New York Passive House. And I'm gonna share passive progressive. We'll look at adoption in New York City and how we can accelerate it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back to, to 2010. Uh, BS is only three years old. There's only 10 certified passive house homes uh, in the United States. And a, a group of professionals, many of you probably here, uh, got together and saw a need for energy efficient built environment and started uh, the New York Passive House. Um, and I'm skipping ahead a bit. This is this is an abridged version of a larger presentation, so we'll be jumping around a little bit, but hopefully it's still uh, uh, nice and coherent. Uh, in 2013, we see our first uh, Passive House certified in New York City. Uh, it's a, it's a um, brownstone in Brooklyn, tight house by Fabrica 718. Uh, that same year, our firm, uh, along with our development partners related and Hudson companies, win an RFP uh, to develop the house, which is a graduate student residence at Cornell Tech's new campus. Uh, Cornell Tech had really aggressive uh, sustainability goals, energy efficiency goals, and Passive House was what we proposed um, to, to achieve that for this particular building. Uh, the following year in 2014, uh, we see the first certified passive house multifamily uh, building in the country, uh, affordable multifamily building in the country, uh, the kind of groundbreaking Knickerbocker Commons by architect Chris Benedict. And that was a you know, really influential project, a, so much so that a, it found itself as a case study in the One City Built to Last, this great document that was put out uh, by the Bill de Blasio administration that was kind of outlining what are the climate strategies we have available to us to meet our goals. And Passive House was identified as one of them, which is a really important kind of moment. Uh, in 2015, we see the uh, R951 multifamily uh, residence by Paul A. Castrucci Architects. Uh, in, it, I highlight this one because it is both Passive House certified and net zero ready, and it starts to kind of you know, marry these tools that we have of building electrification and uh, passive buildings uh, in a way that I think is going to be really influential. So 2016, building on that document that one city built to last, uh, the city issues its first RFP that requires passive house as part of the response. This is a city owned site in East Harlem and uh, the uh, Department of Housing Preservation Development, HPD, uh, along with the, the mayor's office, put this RFP out there and said Passive House has to be part of it. They wanted a demonstration project showing that Passive House could be performed at scale and, and uh, for affordable housing. Our firm, along with uh, our development partners, uh, Jonathan Rose Companies, l &M Development, and Acacia Network, uh, won that competition, and we'll, we'll see how that progresses. Uh, in 2017, the house at Cornell Tech finally opens, it is certified, and it becomes the largest and tallest passive house building in the world, really showing what, what can be done here with this uh, protocol. Jumping ahead to 2019, this was a really pivotal year uh, in the city and I think in the country in general. Uh, NYSERDA announces uh, the Buildings of Excellence competition with an initial funding of $30 million to reward the design, construction, and operation of resilient, climate-friendly multifamily buildings. A resilient, climate-friendly multifamily buildings, that sounds like a passive house. Uh, and you're, you know, if that's what you were thinking, you're right. 70% uh, of the awardees of that first uh, phase there were pursuing passive house certification. And now they just did round five most recently, and they're opening up round six. But round five, I believe 100% of the projects were seeking um, passive house certification. So passive house, really critical 
um, uh, to, to meeting these uh, climate goals. Uh, and you know, 2019 was also a year we saw some incredible legislation passed in New York City. We passed the Climate Mobilization Act, which included Local Law 97, which is going to set limitations on emissions moving forward. Um, we, at the state level, we passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, which set out how we were going to get to a 100% renewable uh, grid, uh, which is critical, obviously, for the electrification of buildings. And a quarter million New Yorkers hit the streets and demanded that we do more uh, for, for climate uh, in, in our city. In 2020, we got our new and what is now our current version of the, the, the energy code in both New York City and at the state level. Um, the state code, the uh, NYSERDA stretch code, um, not the base code, the stretch code, uh, had residential provision in the residential provisions included passive house which was the first time we saw that show up in one of our, our um, new york codes at the city level we don't have any passive house but we do start to see language that reinforces passive house design things like thermal bridges are showing up and over the next couple of years we just see this this explosion of large-scale passive house largely affordable but not entirely um multifamily buildings come online uh, Curtis and Ginsburg, Datner, Cook Fox, uh, you know, all these really great projects that are demonstrating the, you know, what this um, standard can do. Uh, 425 Grand Concourse is the largest FIA certified building to date by Datner, uh, and it's mixed use. It's also mixed income, which I think is important. This is not only for affordable housing. Um, and we saw that with other examples that were happening in this time period, uh, Flow Chelsea and Convivium um, by ZH Architects and Architectonica, respectively. Um, we also start to see, not in New York City, but some other, uh, you know, typologies uh, certifying. We have the Hotel Marcel by Becker and Becker, um, which is not in New York City, but I, I highlight it because it is adaptive reuse, it is all electric, uh, and it is a uh, passive house. And I think, you know, we're starting to, to, again, kind of marry these different concepts into to one cohesive um, um, kind of uh, ideology for how buildings should, should be built in this future that we want to see. In 2022, the first um, uh, phase of Sendero Verde opens, it's certified, it becomes the largest uh, certified passive house residential development in the country. And it's you know proving out that this RFP that we sought uh, to achieve in 2016 is achievable. Um, and we're starting to see you know all of these great built works influence city documents, HBD issues, their revised design guidelines uh, that include several passive house strategies and passive house certification itself as a reach criteria. So we're saying, you know, let's, let's strive for these things in our HPD projects. Uh, there's additional funding opportunities from HPD and NYSERDA. Uh, also in 2023, we see other kind of, uh, legislative, uh, efforts to support high performance buildings. New York passes the first statewide ban on gas. We see uh, this great zoning bonus uh, incorporated into our zoning text that allows 5% more floor area for buildings that exceed code by 15% and are all electric, something that Passive House certainly can achieve. Outside New York, uh, our office is certifying or uh, has completed two other large scale Passive House buildings at this time, Harmony Commons, a dormitory in Toronto and uh, Winthrop Center, a, a commercial office building in Boston. I, I just highlight these because we're seeing how it can expand beyond um, multifamily. You know, passive house could be used um, in multiple different typologies. But of course, multifamily is really uh, where it's booming. And in 2023, 2024, we see a lot more um, projects come online. Engine 16 by Ingui, uh, you know, projects by Datner, uh, projects by Curtis Ginsburg, by Magnuson. And then also the final phase of Sendero Verde opens, kind of completing this demonstration project uh, it is in operation, it is occupied, lots of positive feedback. So, you know, what we see here is this, is this great kind of um, increase in, in passive house adoption in New York City. And that is not stopping. Even in this, you know, it, you know kind of <laughs> regressive place we're in at a federal level, at the, at the state and city level, we are, we are marching forward uh, and we are, we are um, climbing uphill here, but it's not enough. If we want to mitigate the worst effects of climate change, we need to accelerate this. We need to, to really get it going. Uh, and we see 2025 as an inflection point in trying to accelerate, uh, largely because next year we're going to get new um, stretch code and NYC um, energy code. So in the city here, we're really focused. We've been really focused on pushing those things to accelerate it. Um, so now 
back half of this presentation, I just want to talk about what tools do we have to accelerate progress? You know, what have we been doing here? What can you do uh, where you are? What have you already been doing? Uh, we have policy data and people. Starting with policy, uh, this is a document that our group at New York Passive House recently issued stating our policy objectives uh, for, a, you know, uh, ex accelerating the adoption of Passive House. The first thing is we want to elevate that baseline. We want our baseline energy codes to be as close to Passive House as we can get them. Um, so, you know, commenting, being on advisory committees, trying to drive those codes um, and, and demonstrating that or explaining that our experience shows that we can have higher performance buildings when it comes to U values, uh, you know, thermal performance, ventilation, all these different great things that we know about. Um, we also want Passive House certification as an alternative compliance path. Uh, we want to get that into the stretch code and into New York City code uh, so that, you know, you don't need to do code models and passive house models. We can have a pathway that merges them. That's what they're doing in Massachusetts. And it seems to be working quite well in accelerating adoption there. So we, we want to copy that in New York City. We encourage other jurisdictions to do the same. And then, of course, increasing incentives to broaden passive house adoption across multiple sectors. I don't have time to get into all those here, so I'm just going to leave that one at that here. Jump to data. You know, the next tool that we have in our kit here is, is data, and it's all data that we together as a community have produced. And this data is essential because, you know, there's lots of objections to why this is too hard or why this is not feasible, and that data helps combat that. Um, you know, passive buildings are too expensive to build. Well, the data that we see indicates that an investment of 3% or less uh, can achieve passive house buildings, and that plays out through multiple documents and reports that have been issued. This great document for Passive House Network in 2021. Um, in the next section here, you'll see QR codes, you know, snap a picture uh, so you can save it for later, um, or I'll, you know, this will be circulated, but you can, oh, these are links to all these different documents. Um, this was a, a um, review of 16 Passive House buildings and what the cost impacts were there. Um, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center found that uh, the average increase in cost was around uh, two and a half percent across their uh, slate of buildings. There was this great document that Theus and the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency put together um, looking at cost per square foot of, of passive house versus non-passive house, also demonstrating that, you know, that that investment is, is minimal. Um, in some cases, it's even more affordable <laughs> to do passive house. Uh, and we're seeing that bear out in our work. You know, Sendero Verde construction cost was around a 6% increase in 2019 and 2021. Our latest passive house that under construction now um, is less than 2%, you know, so that, that cost is really being driven down. That's because of the experience in the industry uh, with our team, with contractors, with consultants. It's also because that baseline is elevated. You know, we have a higher code now in 2025 20, uh, than we did uh, in 2019. Um, but it's not just about first cost. There's also utility savings, of course, and there's, there's a, a lot of great documentation of that. This report by Building Energy Exchange highlights you know, cost reductions for passive house buildings, also emissions reductions, which is another, um, you know, really important factor to be paying attention to. Um, there's reports out there that show that, you know, the um, the outcomes of passive house stay kind of in a tighter range than in, with, with code and lead. I thought this was a really interesting document that uh, the Massachusetts CEC put out. Um, and this illustrates something that I think is really important, and that's that there is, um, there is this kind of uh, comprehensive effort to drive energy demand down. Um, and that can be used, I think, to help combat another objection that we see, that passive building actual performance doesn't match projections. Uh, and that's something that you know, is, is true, is happening in large scale passive house buildings. Um, you know, at Sendero Verde, uh, our, our operational EUI is around 30.7, our model was around 16.7. Um, it's important to note that, you know, all these orange passive house buildings are still performing significantly better um, than, than code minimum comps that are not passive house. Um, but this discrepancy is still something that, that you know, needs to be explored um, and has been explored in, in um, a lot of uh, places by a lot of, a lot of you on the call, probably. Um, one of the great document here uh, that Lois and Mark Ginsburg and, and Justin Stein put together for Nessie is uh, this, this document that looked at a range of passive house buildings comparing operational and uh, modeled EUIs, talks about why this discrepancy exists. You know, I encourage everybody to take a look at this. This is very valuable in kind of addressing that objection. Um, and one of the things that I think that document highlights is that the discrepancy is really 
not in thermal energy demand. It's in kind of domestic hot water. It's in plug loads. It's in uh, occupant behaviors, and and you know why that's important is because it 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 um, you know it allows us to still have this very affirmative case for passive buildings, which is that passive buildings support beneficial electrification, and there's a lot of data out about this as well. Um, that you know the thermal loads are just absolutely crushed when you um, do passive house buildings, um, and that is. Uh, you know, there's this great report uh, that that uh, Stephen Winter Associates put together for Massachusetts when developing their stretch code, and it just shows that the peak loads are so much lower for passive house buildings than code minimum buildings, and it, we've seen that in our buildings. Uh, our post occupancy data, at University of Toronto, shows this incredible. I love this graph because it shows this this incredible flat use. The green bar is our our building across the year, almost no peaks compared to another dorm on campus that has these peaks. That's valuable for electrification because if if the utility companies have to build a grid to to meet the peak demand, they'd much rather be meeting this peak demand than this peak demand. All right, we're we're really quashing the amount of infrastructure that needs to get a that is going to be needed to get us to an electrified future. I'm running out of time, so I won't um, touch on these too much. You know, there's cases for resiliency. Uh, there's cases for uh, better indoor air quality over uh, comparable um, certifications. And again, you'll you'll be able to see all this and, and download these reports. They're all publicly available. A lot of you have been part of putting them together, I'm sure. Um, so a lot of data out there supporting a wide range of benefits, but data is only good as a story we tell with it. And that's kind of what Michael was saying at the beginning. You know, community is the most important thing here. Uh, it's the people. It's how we build constructive, context-specific, data-driven arguments for these buildings, how we use what data is available uh, to us to kind of communicate the value of these buildings, how we pitch them to our audience. I love what they did at Flow Chelsea for their leasing materials. They're talking about the building being restorative and good air quality. Uh, you know, not necessarily about energy. You know, they're trying to to draw people in via that method. Um, you know, and language we use obviously really important. Passive house is confusing. People think about a house. We should talk about it as passive buildings. Talk about cost instead of energy demand. Talk about pollution instead of emissions. Investment instead of premium. Thinking about the way we're talking about these things to really speak to our audience. And of course, supporting and expanding our community. Um, you know, that is the most important thing. You know, we all support each other. Everything that I've shown here today is the collection of things that all of you have been part of putting together. Um, so, you know, continuing that trend, that is how we accelerate this. You know, building science makes this building passive. Uh, but people, policy, creativity, and collaboration is what makes it progressive. And, you know, very much looking forward to seeing, you know, where we all take this uh, in the future. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis. Uh, that was great. And what a good kickoff to the conference. Uh, what a great overview of Passive House in New York City. 